live right here in Chicago. I'm with Sister Karima Mohammed, AKA Fanny Brown, the God Sister of Soul, and um, the son of James Brown, the legend. Everybody know James Brown, Daryl Brown. Welcome, man. How's it going? Listen, what, for you, what you all don't know, what you haven't heard yet, uh, some of you may have, we're talking about the murder of James Brown. James Brown has been dead now since 2006, but yet there's still a lot of things that are starting to come to light uh, on his death that uh, people are just not certain about. Um, a lot of people died, and you're going to hear a little bit about that. Um, a lot of strange things have happened. Um, he's still not quite buried. Um, his wishes have not been filled. His will has not been filled. His will has not even been filed. Um, so you're going to hear a whole bunch of different things coming to you. So right now, let me introduce you to um, James Brown's sister, Fanny Brown, and his son, Daryl. Again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Now, now, Daryl, let's just jump to you real quick. First, also, you got a you got a book that um, in, inside the Godfather, and you, you tell a little bit about your, your life with your dad, with James Brown. Mm -hmm. Tell us yeah. what you got going on there. Well, that that, that book was uh, made to so that you can um, identify with James Brown. Okay. Uh, I felt like his life had a testimony, and and that's one reason why I wrote the book. You know, and and you, and everything that's in the book now that you. Uh, I mean, you're going to get the truth. You're going to hear the truth. I don't, I don't hold back nothing. The real story of James the Brown. The real story. Okay. You know. And then, Fanny, you're his sister. You, you were on the road with James Brown. Yes. And we're hearing a lot now about James being murdered. Yes, we sir. We talked about that briefly before. Yes, sir. For the people who are hearing that, who's hearing that for the first time, when you say James Brown was murdered, you have to elaborate on that for me. Well, I knew it was something wrong, and I asked for autopsy right after the funeral. And Deanna came to me in my hotel room okay. and said to me. Why was there not an autopsy before the funeral? Well, at first we did not know. But now since Matt Birkbeck, a private investigator that investigate every funeral of every celebrity that dies, have did an investigation on my brother. He came back through his investigation a few years ago and said James Brown was actually murdered. They have footage from the hospital and also a quote from the doctor that he was paid off and that Yama Brown, one of James' stepdaughters that he raised, so she's truly his daughter, and her sister Deanna, who's the oldest daughter to the second wife, Dee Dee, uh, Reverend Al Shopton, and Charles Bobby James Brown, one of the managers, it was two. Charles Bobby bragged to everybody right after the funeral that he never filed the last corbius to James Brown's will. And none of us know what it was. None of us understood what he was talking about. And I said, what do you mean you didn't file his last will? And he said, well, Fanny, I thought it was really bad that he wasn't leaving his children anything. And I wasn't going to let it go without being there for the children. So he filed the will that James made in the 70s when he knew that James had actually made a new will in 2006. Also, because James had beat the table down in July of 2006 with Candace, Tommy Ray, Roosevelt Johnson. What, what do you mean beat the table down? He was just steady beating the table, beating the table. Fanny, don't you let nobody pull up on me. Don't you let nobody pull up on me. I said, okay, Jane. He did it for 20 to about 40 minutes. And all of us was in the room, Charles Bobby, Tommy Ray. And then at the end he said, not even her. Don't you let Tommy Ray pull up on me either. And I didn't understand what he was talking about, but I kept saying, okay, James, he'll beat it some more. I said, yes, James, I hear you. Do you Tom, hear me? Who was Tommy Ray? Tommy Ray was the wife that he married. He found out that she was already married and had never had a divorce. Okay. He had the marriage and all, but he never let her leave him. Tommy Ray was pregnant with little James, too. And Tommy Ray lived with James all the way through to his death. And, of course, in the southern states, common law, is still accepted. Sure. So she was still his wife. Correct. Yes. Okay. So he didn't even want her to pull up on him. I didn't understand what he was talking about, but I guess by then he had in his own mind that something was going to happen to him because this was June of 2006 that he was demanding me. And I just didn't know what he was talking about, but I kept saying, okay, Jane, I'll make sure, Jane. Ain't nobody going to pull. Okay, okay. And he kept beating the table as if he had gone insane and let me know, don't let nobody pull up on him. What did he mean by that? At, at the time, I didn't understand. And so when they said he was dead, of course, I went into shock because I was supposed to see him the day after they said he was dead. Sure. We had a 17 tour 
going on uh, six shows, four to six shows in New Jersey, New York, New Year's Eve in New York. Then on the 3rd of January, we were going to Canada and going all okay. the way across Canada. So none of us was looking for that. We didn't know what had happened. But in Mac Burbeck's investigation, he said that the doctor had released my brother and told him he had fine shot, everything was fine. He had took James' blood an hour before they come back and found him dead. When he took the blood again, he found poison in James' blood. Okay, let's stop. He took, he took, he took a blood sample. Yes. And said James was fine. Yes, sir. After he died, he took another blood sample. Yes, sir. And, and what happened? What was the results? <coughs> According to Mac Burbeck, he said that the doctor said that James' two managers explained to him that James was a celebrity. They didn't want the bad publicity or anything. Just let it go, and they okay, called. you're not answering the question. You said he took a blood test before he died. Yes, he took a blood test and told James and was he was fine. He took a blood test and he after was he be died. Released. What was the results from the blood test? After he said he that James was poisoned. That's, oh, he said James was poisoned. According to Mac Burbeck's statement, yes, sir. Why was that never investigated? Because we didn't know. This was years after James' death, about okay. three and a half to four years afterward, when Mac Burbeck did the investigation and come back and said what his findings were, and he put it on the internet. And you can go to M A T T B I R B E C K, Matt Burbeck, and you will see the investigation of James and what he found out. Well, after I seen this, because I had went in a depression for three and a half years, didn't even know I was in a depression. Right. Okay. But I had already, 10 months after he died, when someone finally told me, Miss Brown, stop saying you'll see him at the next show. It's not going to be another show. Your brother is dead. And I said, okay, but I'll see him at the next show. My mind wouldn't accept it. Sure. Later on that day, I found myself on the side of the road. I think I'd been there about four to six hours. And I come back to myself crying. And I said after that, oh, my God, he done been dead almost a year. It's 10 days before Thanksgiving. I know I was there. Let me go back and look at the funeral and read the papers. So as I start looking and reading, and I knew what everybody said at the funeral because I was dead ear on everything, and I have a photostatic memory to a lot of things. And as I was reading the man report on James, and then I'm reading what they said, and of course, James had been dead 10 months. So all kind of little bits of things was coming out. And I said, everybody done lied. Everybody that said anything, they all are liars. They said this, then they said that. But the funeral, they said this. So, of course, all the testimonies that they gave, like Reverend Shopton said at the funeral, you can go back and get the funeral. It's in all the newspapers that Charles Bobby called him and told him that James was dead. He said, and he turned over and went back to sleep. If James died at 145, and he called him, and he said the next morning when he woke up, he called Mr. Bobby back, and he said, yeah, your man is dead. You heard right. Well, according to Mac Burbeck investigation, Charles Bobby, Yama Brown, and Reverend Al Shopton left with James' body at 3-something in the morning. Don't know flights leave New York out of no airport to 5 or 6 a.m., so how did he get to Augusta from New York? Charles Bobby said at the funeral that he was the last person to see James alive. He was there when he took his last breath. He said, James said that he was hot. His chest was on fire. He said, and he went and got a cold towel, a towel out of the bathroom, put cold water, came back and put it on James Brown's chest. He said, James Brown, uh, gown had came over a little bit and he had to cover his private parts back up. Those were his exact words at the funeral. So that's what he said at the funeral. Then he come back and told someone else that he left the room for 20 minutes to go get James some insure from the pharmacy or store next to the pharmacy in the hospital. If you've ever been in Emory Hospital, and I'm talking to everybody in Atlanta, Georgia, or that have had to have liver or kidney surgery, Emory Hospital is one of the biggest, best surgeries for anything that's happening to you. And Emory Hospital, their chairs are beds. Your whole family can come okay. there and stay. And the nurses serve you as well as they will the family. So when did Charles Bobby become a nurse or a doctor to where he couldn't ring the bell at James' bedside and call for a nurse or a doctor? He decided he would treat him with a cold towel. It's totally impossible. Well, that, no, that's understandable with a cold towel. But you said something about insure. Yes, he said he left James' bedside to go get James some insure okay. for 20 minutes. Okay. And when he came back, James was in that condition. What condition? He was hot. 
and not doing well. Okay, who is Jackie? Jackie Hollander was a young lady that had cancer when she was a child, from what I understand. James met her and her father in the airport. He gave her a card and told her when she get big and write her first song to call him. Okay. When she got big, she got well of the cancer because he explained to her you can conquer anything, and she believed James Brown. And she started working with the children uh, on a fund that was uh, Wish, Make a Wish Foundation. Okay. And of course, she had the, the thing going, and she got in touch with James. According to what she said, Michael Jackson, Aretha Franklin, all of them have paid money into helping make the WISH program. A lot of people out there that can hear this know that they did too. Put back in the 80s. Right, Correct. in the 80s. I lost a partner in the I Feel Good Trust. I started that trust fund in um, 1985. Um, James Brown and I were doing benefits to help the poor and needy. Um, we were doing anything we could to grant wishes for children that were sick. Um, and this was something we did constantly. We were raising a lot of money, and at the time, um, I had done a record for the Atlanta Falcons that I brought James Brown in on. He sang lead vocals. 100% of the proceeds of that record was to go to the poor and needy children. And it was at that time that um, we started doing benefits because we realized that we could use our music and our talents to help others that were less fortunate. Um, Mr. Brown used to tell me that he was going to be killed. And you always look at somebody and you wonder if it's paranoia. Um, but I know now it wasn't because in the end he was murdered and I had 100% uh, hospital and she had videotapes of them in the hospitals in the early early 80s and when James seen a lot of those cancer patients and if they're living or their families are living they can bear witness to what I'm saying James decided he would put a lot of money into helping those children make a wish then he said to Miss Hollander we're going to call it the I Feel Good Trust Fund. Okay. And that's how the I Feel Good come on it. And after years and years of going through torment and pain with people and with family members and everybody hurting him over and over, and then his two daughters sued him over the movie Toys for two songs that he had in there that he wrote when one of them was one and the other one was like five years old. So they weren't even in school. You know they couldn't write a song. Uh, Get up off of that thing was in the movie and another one of the songs. So when they sued James, James tried to give them monies according to what he thought the records had sent for the records on the movie toy. Mind you, he's getting hundreds of thousands every week from all the records he made in the time of his lifetime okay. of doing music. So he had somebody count down what he thought they had made on the movies and offered it to them. And both the daughters, Deanna and Yama, both refused the money that he offered them. So they sued him. They sued their father. They sued their father after he had given them money, sent them to school, made sure they went to college, had a college education, sent Purpose Span to come to Atlanta, Georgia, and got his own radio station and trained Deanna to run a radio station. I had a chance to come down and sit with her all day one day and help her feed in records that was the hit pop talk at the time. So with all he did for them, sent Yama to school, she became a farmer. She's Dr. Yama Brown. She's a farmer. Lamar. We're going to yes. talk about that in, in a little bit because she didn't live that far from the hospital. That's what, what I understand. I'm not sure what she lived and we're going to talk about that, but I want to, I want, Daryl, I want to talk to you a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and we want to bring it up to 2014, and you're now hearing all of this about your father being murdered. Of course, you, you toured with your father for a little bit. You, you got with him in the band. You start playing the guitar. You toured with your father for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what, what are you feeling about this now? Well, I'm not just hearing about it. You're not? Oh, you, you knew? You because, kind of knew I, it? because I knew it from the, from the beginning. What do you mean? That he was murdered. Wow. It didn't make sense. Okay. You know, you, here it is. I'm, I'm, I was, matter of fact, I had talked to him that uh, Friday night. Uh, that was the same day the toy giveaway was. You know, we did the toy giveaway uh, a day before Christmas Eve, the 23rd. So 
And he didn't. He thought I was already going to New Jersey because I go up there every year. I take my kids and everybody. We go stay with my mother. Okay. So he thought I was gone, but I was there. And uh, he came to the toy giveaway, and he was kind of, you know, he he wasn't. He was breathing funny, real funny. Like you know, he couldn't catch his breath. So I told him, I said, well, look, y'all take him home. You know, I said because he he doesn't look well. So anyway, that day, that Saturday, when he was with in was Emory Hospital that he was in the, in the hospital, I kept calling every hour on the hour. And see, I know my daddy would talk to me, you know, and, and especially my mother on, since Christmas Eve and my children, he Correct. would always talk to them. But Mr. Bobbitt would intercept the phone and he said, Dad don't want to talk to nobody now. He don't want to talk to anybody, blah, blah. I said, okay, I'm gonna call again. I called again on another hour. He tells me, we start talking about his condition and everything, he says, and they can tell everything he did you know, and I'm saying, why are you saying, keep saying that to me? This is, now, that was the first time. The second time, he did the same thing again. They could tell everything he did and all this. And uh, I'm like, What's, I mean, who didn't know what he did? What are you talking about? So I get the call that night. And uh, if I can remember, it was about 12.15. Okay. Now, either they did it then or they were planning on doing it. But I got the call at 12.15 that he was, he was gone. And it was such a funny thing. It's funny. You can tell a person when they cry, when they fake cry. He fake cried. Man. Oh my goodness! You, you see what I'm saying? When he telling me about it, and then all of a sudden he just straightened right straight. I mean, because when it hit me, I cried for about a half hour. Now, Mr. You're talking about Mr. Bobbin. Mr. Bobbin. Who yeah. is Mr. Bobbin in relationship to James Brown? Why was he at his bedside, and you I mean, weren't at his bedside, yeah, because, or you weren't at his bedside? Well, see. The reason why I wasn't in the bedside, because I, I explained to you, I go to my mother's on Christmas. Okay, so you know, you're out of town. Right. So, and, and then we were going to be in Hartford, Connecticut that Monday, but they had canceled that, so, because they wanted to keep him in the hospital, they cleared his chest up and everything, saying he was doing well, they just want to keep him one more night. So we weren't going to do Hartford, because everybody agreed, like, well, you know, he's got to get well. Right. So we were going to go to B.B. King's Club. You see, Mr. Bobbitt is his manager at the time. He was a manager, but he actually worked for Intrigue Music. He was a road manager. Okay. Okay. So, you know, like keep your friends close, enemies closer, that kind of thing. That I always thought do. that, you know, he 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 didn't, he didn't have my father's best interest. In Something came out further in the investigation as you guys started talking about Mr. Bobbitt also having a connection with Michael Jackson the day he Same died thing. or the night he died. What was that all about? Well, I don't. This I can't collaborate on that part, but I can tell you one thing. Let me, say, let me explain something to you. I called his publicist. Okay, because Mr. Bobby had told me that he got that he after his contract was up. He had a two-year contract. Mm -hmm. They didn't bring him back because he was too business and everything. And they, but I found out that Mr. Bobby got fired from from Michael Jackson. Okay. Okay. Wasn't no two years. He got fired. Got fired for stealing money. Okay. For stealing money. You hey. know. So his whole past and everything that he's done, if you know him like we know him, you know, it's it, it, this don't make sense. And everything that he did, he says one thing, but then there's something else that you find out oh, that didn't happen, you know. He so, gave James Brown insurer, is what we're hearing. Let me explain something about that insurer. First of all, <laughs> when he went down to get the insurer, the pharmacy was closed. Let's get that straight, okay? Pharmacy closed at 10 o'clock. You do not need nobody, no, he didn't have to go out and get the insurer. He could have told one of the nurses to get the insurer. So why was he going to get insurer? You see? And leave him alone. And leave as him he alone like that. You, you for, see, 20 for 20 minutes. But see, the other when you when you start connecting the dots, which my aunt have done, it came, and then I start seeing because I've always felt like it was a murder. I didn't. I never felt like it, because that was. It was no way that you can be fine, chest clear, everything. You up talking, laughing, joking, having a good time, and then 20 minutes, a half hour, maybe an hour later, you dead. Mm. It just don't happen. Okay. So now. Go ahead, Fanny. I want to talk on Mr. Bobby. I didn't know Charles Bobby. I've seen him a couple of times in the 70s when he was working for James. 71, James had the Future Shock TV show, his own TV show. It was something like Soul Train. Okay. And we used to go down on Wednesday and tape in Atlanta Wednesday evenings. Mr. Bobby happened to be there the night that Deanna and Yama came with their mother to the Future Shock TV show. We were shooting at the time they came, so when they brought Deanna in, they 
I told her, come on over to me, and we were on stage dancing, so I had her dancing with me. Dee Dee had just came in with Yama, which was a new baby. I think she was maybe two weeks and a half to maybe a month old. And out of nowhere, James started screaming, cut, cut, take that camera off Fanny, get that camera off Fanny. And I'm like, I didn't know what was going on. But of course, uh, the good foot was out or something like that. We were all dancing and big payback and all of that. And so when he said and it started coming toward me, Deanna broke from me and went and sat on the side of the stage. They had two stoops made all the way across okay. the wall. And so James walked right past me when I thought it was me he was talking about. He went and got Deanna by the hand and took her back and handed her to Gertrude Sanders, the wardrobe lady, Miss Gertrude Sanders, that raised me on the road and told Gertrude Sanders, take her on out there with her mama and told Mr. Bob and them, take her and that bastard child out of here what now. Was, what was the reason for that? He said it wasn't his baby. Yama. Yes. Was not his child. Yama is, he is where he's buried now. He's buried. No, Deanna has his body on her property. Oh, okay, not the same place. The oldest daughter has him on her property. What's in James' will where he wanted to be buried? What's in his will? Well, he had kept telling us that he wanted soul land. Okay. That's what he kept saying. He borrowed uh, 30 million from Warden Chapel in order to build soul land. And he borrowed the money and gave them a 30 year of all his records for them to sell or use or do whatever they needed to do for 30 years after then, everything was to go back to his grandchildren, okay. all the grandchildren. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump way ahead because you, you, we, we said this was murder. James Brown called his children together. No, Tommy Ray wanted to have a Thanksgiving dinner and she had been bugging James and bugging him and bugging him about why he not letting the kids come. Okay. He had said, I'm through with them, I'm through with them. They ain't my daughter, they ain't. and I said, James, they are you. They ain't my daughter, I'm through with them, never wanna hear nothing about them, I'm through. So they had broke his heart so bad when they sued him. They don't know the pain that he went through. But then when you understand children that's growing up and their father on the road every day and they're not there. That was the blessing that I had. I was there from a teenager okay. on. So by me being out there with him for 40 years off and on, I think the last, I want to say about 13 to 14 years, I wasn't there. And then he had me to start coming back out on the weekends and whenever he was close. Fanny, get your thing, come okay, on I'm back out here. I'm trying to get here. to where but I met the kids Mr. together. Okay, let me finish with Mr. Bobby first. No, I, I, I met Mr. Bobby in 1983 to know him as who he was at Jimmy Nolan's funeral, James Brown lead guitar. And that's how I met him. That was the first time I met him. I seen him two or three days because of the situation going on with the funeral. And I think he helped pay for Jimmy Nolan's funeral. That was it as far as I knew Mr. Bobby. When I seen Mr. Bobby again, it was New Year's Eve of 1999. He was at the Atlanta uh, Theater in Las Vegas. James was doing the show that night, dinner and supper show with James Brown in Las Vegas. And of course, I went in for that. And when I came down from my room and I walked in the building with one of my sisters, and may God be pleased with her, Sister Gloria, may he also be pleased with my brother James. And I could hear James, but I didn't know what was going on because there wasn't no music or nothing. When I walked in the room, James was on stage in a robe and in his pajamas just talking. And I went back and I said, Judge Bradley, what in the world is going on? Why are he on the stage like that? Don't ask me. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. So when I got to the dressing room, there was Mr. Bobbitt. And I said, what happened to my brother? Well, we took him out there with us today. I said, who is we? Me and Judge Bradley, and, and he just walking through the street, bobbing people and talking bad to people. And I'm saying, y'all didn't know what was wrong with him? Why you all didn't say something so we would know? So they said nothing. We didn't know what was happening with James, but he was saying, I never loved nobody but my wife, Velma. I never loved nobody but Velma, and I should have stayed with Velma, what do you think who was, was his on? first wife. They had gave him something to make him high. Somebody had brought him something. I don't know who, because I hadn't seen him. Okay. I just came to the hotel, got dressed, and came down for the concert. Okay, now I'm going to bring you back ahead again because I was trying to get Go somewhere ahead. real quick because we talked, um, uh, we're trying to, we still talk about this murder, but there was a point where you told me that all the kids came together when he told the children that they weren't, he wasn't leaving them anything, and, and you're saying that was a motive. I have to quote that. I have, have to, to quote that. This. That quote came from Deanna Brown. I've okay. always been her sounding board 
since she was, I want to say, an early teenager, okay. she would call and complain about what he wasn't doing for them, what she should and felt she should have and he should do because he was her father. She called me the day after Thanksgiving and she said, I know for a fact now that he hate all of us. And I said, what are you talking about? Dad hate all of us. I know he hate us all. I said, what are you talking about? She said, we went to the house. Tommy Ray invited us for Thanksgiving dinner. And when we got there, he opened the door and went in a room and closed himself in the room and he never came out. We were there with all of his grandchildren and he never came back out to even break bed or say hello or nothing to us. He just walked away. But she did say that at the end he did come out and tell them what none of them get nothing. He wasn't leaving none of them nothing. She said, I know for a fact now that he hate us all. What do you tie in um, to motive for murder? I tie in the motive for murder. The 30 million that James took to build up soul land and then when he told them they wasn't getting nothing, he let them know that all of it was going to needy children from all backgrounds, all over the world, all needy children. So the will was never put there because Charles Bobbitt decided that he did not want James to have a will that his children wasn't involved with. So the last codicil of James Brown will, Charles Bobbitt did not put it through. Wow. Listen, we, 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 this, this has been investigated, but you're bringing out new information. Who are we talking to today in 2014 that we can get this new information to? Uh, are we talking to anybody with the federal government, FBI? Well, Jackie Hollander, since she started the trust fund, she had filed suit. Her lawyer has filed suit for autopsy on James. She had filed suit for the trust fund. She and James got almost to the grand jury with the trust fund before he died. And her statement, I quote, she the said, grand James jury, you mean said, the Supreme Court. You said, you said the grand su jury. Supreme Court, right. And she said that uh, James told her that they were going to kill him. It was too much money involved and too many people that was involved in the money. Okay, we have a few minutes. A lot of, a lot of people died after James died. Yes. Go over that with me, because if a lot of people died directly after James died, then somebody's in charge of ordering murder or killings. Someone was assassinated. Well, everybody that was at the hospital, according to what we understand that the gentleman investigated, the two lawyers, David Cannon, his wife, and his son was murdered, both within the same hour. Someone come to the door, asked for him. His son didn't get a chance to say Junior. He said, I'm David Cannon. They killed him. The police was called. They called the mother, and the mother on her way back was ran off the road into a telephone pole and then a tree. His family is dead. The next one, Chip Lamar, yeah, my husband, goes on national TV and Atlanta Magazine and Channel 46 in Atlanta and say, I know for a fact, for a surety, my father did not die of a heart attack. I was there. I was there when he took his last breath. I know he didn't die of a heart attack. Wow. He was gunned down after Yama called him to come take the children and get some ice cream. After they got a divorce, and she guaranteed that he couldn't get no money from the children if they inherited anything from James. And she called him to take the children for ice cream close to her daughter's birthday. And he went, and 20 minutes after he left her on his way home, when he got home, five men gunned him down, according to the Atlanta news. They gunned him down. Okay, we're gonna have to end this. But this is something that clearly we need to follow up on. How you have a book out in, inside The Godfather. Of course, it tells the truth about James Brown, your dad, and life on the road with James Brown. Exactly. Is there anything in here related to the murder or the death or what you guys assume to be murder? Well, I, I bring up things. Okay. I, I bring up you the bring fact that I thought things. that my father was, was murdered. Sure. How do we reach you all? How do we reach you? How does the public see well, you? You, well, you can in, find me on um, uh, waterallpublishing.com. Uh, you can tweet me. Okay. Uh, you can. I'm on Amazon.com. The audio, the book is. Sure. Uh, but WaldorfPublishing.com. You can contact me. It has the numbers and everything. Okay. We want to thank you all for coming out. I'm here with um, Abdel Brown, of course, the son of James Brown, Sister Karima Muhammad, um, formerly known as Fanny Brown, the God Sister of Soul. And um, you know, it's 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 sad to know that uh, icon, a legend like ours, you know, is lost. First of all, that we lost him, and then for all this to come about. But uh, my name is Kevin Fuller, and uh, we, we just, as, as news comes, we'll get it right to you. And I want to thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we love you, and we'll see you.
all started out as a normal day, our first night out. He wined and dined me. After dinner, he took me dancing. We drank and danced the whole night long, a time to remember. Within several hours, we found ourselves locked together, entwined in each other's arms. My night to become sexually swept off my feet. Before daybreak, we both made love, ending up between the sheets. This night was one of the greatest nights of my life in finding somebody to love me. Lying in his arms, in my heart, I knew I never wanted this moment to end. Yes, I admit, this was the greatest night of a girl's life, or was it? Yes, we made love until the morning daylight. What we both forgotten was the number one most important part about having sex, protection. Well, I thought you should know this. Now, I must return back to bed. If you're going around having unprotected sex, there's always thousands of vacancies in my community. Over here, no one is turned away. To gather more information on STD, go online and search for sexual transmitted disease.